I have the pleasure of speaking with a man who has had a conversion experience. Excuse me. Let's start that one more time. It is the Wednesday after Easter, and I have the pleasure of speaking with a man who's had a conversion experience that is beyond tumultuous, almost to the level of St. Paul on his road to Damascus. <laughs> Mr. Wendell White, how are you today? I'm great, sir. How about yourself? I cannot complain. Uh, your story is quite fascinating. Your book is titled The Devil Thought He Had Me. Yes, sir. And uh, it, it starts off when you were 18 years old as a drug dealer's gone, ba or a drug deal's gone bad, and you end up in the trunk of the car. Uh, it's your story to tell, my friend. Oh, man. Well, you know what? It's, the, the story started way before I was 18. Um, that's, just, that's just how we got to there. But the story started as a, as a, as a child. Um, raised by a single mom of my mom had nine children. I was the second oldest. Yeah. And, um, man, my mom sold drugs and everybody around me sold drugs. So, um, you know how you have some, some, some children in the family, they say they watch dad or they watch mom. They go off to work every day and they say, man, my mom's a lawyer. My dad's a doctor or, and they, and they want to, um, imitate mom or dad or whatever occupation they is well that's how it was in my household i didn't i didn't have a dad so um the the, the closest male figure that i had in my life at the time was my uncle and uh by the time my uncle was like 22 23 years old man he had like over a million dollars from drugs selling drugs so that's who i imitated that's who i wanted to be like and uh man we just i just took on that role of saying like man i want to sell drugs as a child. Now, were you like 13, 14 years old when you started selling? Like, yep, I started selling. I started selling drugs. I started selling um, crack cocaine um, at the age of like 13, 14 years of age. But I was always around it, even even as a even as a child, 10, 11, 12 years old. I was around it. Like even I talk about the time in my book when um, my aunt, when my auntie, my mom's sister, she had us transporting drugs from. Um, the, 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 the low end of Chicago to the, um, to the, to the South suburbs, we call it the wild hundreds in Chicago. So we was, we, we would get on the city bus at 10, 11 years of, of age, um, at eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night. And we would take drugs from 79th to 115th to one of my cousins, to one of my cousins who was selling the drugs for her, even though we wasn't selling the drugs, um, we were still involved in it. At, at a tender age of like 10, 11, 12 years old. And fully understanding what's going on or just being a little kid and goes, hey, my aunt wants me to go on the bus and drop off this box for somebody, so I'm just going to listen to my aunt and go. Well, you know what? Fully understanding what was going on, like we, we sat and we would watch her bag the drugs up into $10 bags and put them in, in, the, in the bags that they would go in. And then she would um, wrap the bags up in um, sacks of uh, tens with they each sack was a hundred dollars a piece and then um she would give them to us and then man we she had sent us on on our way as children um, uh before we get into the mo most important part of the story is, is uh your your conversion and, and your uh ex religious experience uh there will be some people that make the argument for the legalization of drugs and that it would be safer for people that were either in your situation or you know, people that did make it out, uh, that if drugs had been legalized and taxed and regulated, you wouldn't be in that situation to begin with. What's your take on it now, having survived on the other end for people with that perspective? Well, um, and, 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 and that's a good question, and, and, and to, to each his own. I don't believe, I, I don't believe that would have did anything. I believe the, um, just trying to eliminate drugs as a whole would do better than legalizing it, you know, because at the end, what, what you're, what you're saying about legalizing it is basically you're saying, um, we're all going to get a cut out of it, you know, and that's still, it's still, what about, what about that, that, that mother or that father that's selling their food stamps to, 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 to support this habit and, you know, neglecting their children, they, they, they still losing out whether it's legal or not. They, they, they still losing. So just eliminating the drugs as a whole, I think that would be the best thing than just saying we're going to legalize it so we can profit off of it, you know, And but still so many people are still hurt. All we got to do is look at the opioid epidemic right now. So many people is 
Um, they are profiting off of it because it's legal. But look how many people are, are, are dying from it. Look how many families are being destroyed from it. And um, you really, you, I mean, just with anything, it can be abused. Even though it's legal, though, it doesn't mean it can't be abused. And, and when you abuse it and you're doing it the wrong, you're doing it the wrong way and for the wrong reason, you still get chaos and confusion out of it. It still is no benefit, even though these pharmaceutical companies is making hundreds of billions of billions of dollars off of, off of legal drugs. Absolutely. Else that's been legalized. Um, you know, what? How old were you the first time that you were arrested? Because at 18 years old, getting stuffed in the, in the trunk of a car and about to be assassinated, uh, you know, this wasn't your first go around. You were on the bus, 10 years old, transporting stuff. So you had to have been arrested at some point. Juvenile detention. Uh, you know, as a minor, they they probably let you off with warnings or, or lesser charges because you're not 18. Uh, how did the descent progress from? 10 years old to 18 years old. Well, um, the first time, the first time I was ever arrested, I believe I was, I believe I was like 12 or 13 years old. And, um, I had got caught with like, uh, a hundred bags of, uh, crack cocaine, $110 bags of crack cocaine. I was standing on my grandmother's porch and, um, I, I got arrested, but they didn't, they didn't put the drugs on me. They put the drugs on the two older guys that was on the porch with me because when they went in all of our pockets, um, I had like five dollars in my pocket, and they had big wads of cash in their pocket. So when they when I saw the police coming, I had threw the drugs, but I thought I threw them over the porch, but they end up landing in the corner of the porch. So when they found the drugs, they um they put them in the car and they was asking me like um, you know whose stuff is it? Whose stuff is it? Man, I'm scared. I'm 12, 13 years old. I'm just crying. I'm saying, I don't know. I don't know. But I never told them it, they were day drugs. I just said, I didn't know. I didn't know. And then um, I, I'm steady saying that they was like, no, nah, you know this state stuff. I said, no, nah, it ain't theirs. I don't know whose it is. We was just standing right here. We just we just came on the porch. I don't know whose it is. But the police knew the house was a, a known drug house where, where, where they was coming to. And then... Um, Yep, I end up going to jail that night. I end up going to jail the first time that night. But in Chicago, when um when you're when you're arrested as a minor, all you have to do is make a phone call to somebody that's 21 and older, they could come get you. So you don't you don't have to go to like no juvenile detention center or nothing like that. So um I, I my mom, she stayed in Mil in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin at the time. My father, my my father was never around. So um I end up calling my best friend, I end up calling her mom. And her and her mother came and picked me up from um, the, the the precinct that night. Now, was there any repercussions from grandma? Like she was mad at you or anything? Or she was like, that's just the life that you guys live. So that's what it is. Well, no, nah, it, it really wasn't no repercussions behind any of the things. Because even grandma sold drugs. You know, it was her house. She sold drugs. Um, all of my aunties and uncles, they were strung out on crack cocaine or heroin. So, um, my grandmother was really, she was really providing for the family. Like she had one of the, 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 the biggest, um, crack houses in, in, on the South side of Chicago at that time. So, um, you know, she, that's how we end up getting into it. She'll fall asleep and we, we'll get our own drugs and go to the door and sell them Why why she'll be asleep because she was up to up in age and, you know, she's not going to stay up all night. And it was a consistent all night thing. Like, um, man, we would make forty, fifty thousand dollars a day selling crack cocaine. Wow, I mean that—that's a substantial amount of money, and I can see the temptation, especially being on the south side of Chicago, uh, getting into that lifestyle. And you grew up in it. Your grandma sold, your mom sold. So this is three generations of dealing at the time. Um, what does that do to your psyche? You know, you see it your whole life. You're transporting it at 10 years old. You're arrested at 12 or 13. And then from then on, you know, life gets harder. It doesn't get easier. You know, you become more callous. You become more cold-blooded. You know, you don't necessarily have empathy or even sympathy for anybody. Like, nothing affects you. Like, how dark did it get for you during those years between the first arrest and then the night that, that you had your conversion? Well, you know what? And, and, and I can speak for um, I can speak for me and my cousins at the time. See, one thing one thing about selling drugs, like you have to understand why did we get into the selling drugs? 
And we really got into selling drugs because we were just tired of struggling. You know, we, I, my, my mom wasn't strung out on any type of drugs. My mom didn't drink or smoke or do anything like that. But my cousins, you know, they mothers were strung out on drugs. They, they didn't have the, 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 the bare necessities to even get by, you know, during the day. So it was like, this was the only thing that we seen that we could say, you know what? I want to do this because this is going to get me from, from where I'm at to where I'm trying to go. And where I'm trying to go is not here. You know, we, we in a house that, you know, didn't have hot water. Didn't, you know, it was just, it was just, it was just, man, we was really living a real provincial lifestyle that we as children, when you going to school every day and you, you, you being laughed at because you got holes in your shoes and, um, your, your, your clothes smelling like kerosene from the kerosene heaters and things of that nature, because of, we don't have heat and stuff like that. You you start to take matters into your own hands and say, you know what? If they not gonna do it, I'm gonna do it because I don't want to be I don't want to be um, looked at and laughed at, be the laughing stock of the the the, the classroom and and this then the third. So you know what? I have never seen nobody leave out of my house and go to an um to the to, to, to jump on the bus with a briefcase and a suit and say we going I'm going to work. I seen, I woke up and I seen drug dealers. So these are the people that, that influence me. Like I tell everybody in, in order to, to, in order to know an alternative, you have to see an alternative. If you've never been exposed to an alternative, how do you know what an alternative is? And the person may say, well, you know, you can go to jail. You know, you can dead. Yeah. Them are the options that we already knew that could happen. It's a possibility. We know selling drugs was illegal. You could go to jail. It's a possibility that we knew that um, you could get killed while we were doing this. But those are the things that we were we were willing to live with. Those are the consequences we were living to. We was willing to live with because we thought this was going to make a better life for us. Even though it, even though it was taking us in a as, and like you right as we got older and older, it got more serious and more serious because now it go from you just a child doing these things and, 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 and guys overlooking you to now you're, you're getting up in age and now you got rival gangs looking at you and now you're in the game, now you're packing a gun, now you're shooting and, and, and now it, it goes from you started right here where everything was innocent, now it done, it done blossomed into this big old this side effect that man, now you're seeing, now I have to be a calculated killer because if I don't, they gonna kill me. I can't be soft so I, I, I can't show no weaknesses. I can't show no water and no, no blood in the water. Or if they, if they smell weakness on me, they'll try to kill me. So now you, you, you become disconnected with humanity because now it's just about survival. So it's what is by any means necessary. And by, and, and with that being said, you have best friends killing each other. Now it's nothing. You can't trust it. It's everything is based on cut those lies and thieves now. So how could you trust a life like that? Identity politics was, was really what it was. You know, not only were you a Christian, what type of Christian what you, were you, what denomination did you belong to? You know, what militia were you with? If you were Muslim, are you Shia or Sunni? Are you Christian? Are you Orthodox, Catholic, or Protestant, et cetera, et cetera? And it, it got to those divided lines. So it's similar to what you're, you're talking about happened in Chicago. Um, what about the first time that you actually held a gun, not for, you know, Second Amendment rights and going, you know, I want to be able to protect myself, but I need this just to walk down the street because I'm constantly looking over my shoulder because something bad could happen to me when I least expect it. Well, once um, we was part of a gang and the rival gangs used to try to, um, they used to throw cocktail bombs at my grandma's house, try to burn the house down and stuff like that. And they, it was all over you know, because of the, 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 the drug house, because they wanted to sell the drugs out of the house and make the money. And, um, once you watch, once you continue to watch, um, people, you know, brutalize your family and, 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 and they, you know, they steady beating your aunties and uncles up and they busting out your windows and things like that, man, you, 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 you build this hatred. So now you saying to yourself, like, man, you watched this when you was younger 
Now you older, now you saying, when you was younger, you saying, man, I hate them, I'll kill one of them. Now that you older, now you can get a gun. Now you saying, I wish they would try it now. I wish they would try it now. So the, the, the first time I ever shot at someone, you know, I was scared to death. But at, at the same token, it made me feel good that I was protecting my family. This wasn't even about a gang anymore. This was about my family. I felt so good that, you know what, I'm finally standing up to protect my family. I'm old enough to protect my family from these guys that have been trying to kill us for no reason when we were children and didn't have nothing to do with it. You guys been throwing cocktail bombs and stuff like that through my grandma's window since we was children. We had nothing to do with the stuff that was going on. But now that we're older and we understand, no, nah, y'all, y'all, we, we can't sit back and allow y'all to do stuff like that no more. So you know what? If y'all want to fight, we can fight. If y'all want to shoot, we can shoot. And that's the mentality that you have to adapt because it was like I said, either, either, either you're going to be a shark and, or you go, it's kill to be killed. And then that's, and that's just the life that we live. Now take us back to the night where this drug deal has gone bad and you get stuffed in the trunk of a car and you think this is your last day on earth. Uh, what happened that day that you can share uh, without incriminating either yourself or anyone else involved? Uh, I don't know if statute of limitations have passed. And then the moment in the in the car where you start praying. Well, um, it was it was June 22nd of 1999. Um, I was I was actually supposed to go to a birthday party that one of my one of my close friends was throwing for his son. It was this place downtown Chicago named called Disney Quest. It was new. It was like a um it was like a, a little miniature Disney World. And you know everybody at the time that was the hottest attraction in Chicago at the time. So everybody was trying to get in on that. And now uh, we supposed to have been going to Disney Quest. So I went to this shopping mall on 63rd and Halsted. To um give me a, to, to give me an outfit to wear, um for for the birthday party, and then I my my pager went off. When when I see my pager went off, I recognized the number. I knew exactly who it was. Um, I end up calling the guy back, and he had asked me, um, you know, did I have any did I have any crack cocaine? I told him yeah, and he asked me, can I meet him somewhere? And I t I told him yeah. So I end up jumping in the car that I was in. I end up going to where he was at, and I met him. And um, we end up talking. We just end up talking. He asked me, they said, man, ride with me to drop my sons off at baseball practice. And I'm like, cool, that's cool. So I jumped in his, parked my car. And when I parked my car, I had my gun on me, but I put my gun under the seat of my car because I didn't want to be in his car with no gun. I didn't know if he had license or nothing like that. I didn't want to get pulled over. I knew I had license. So if even if the police would have pulled me over, my license and insurance, they couldn't have searched my car or nothing like that. So I put my gun in my arm um, and under the seat of my car and I got in the car with him. And then, um, man, we end up just riding, riding. The, the party started at two o'clock. It was now about four o'clock. We, we dropped his kids off. Um, I never made it to the party. He told his sons. Then when we dropped them off at, back, at at baseball practice, he told one of his sons. He said, "Man, leave the bat in the car." He said, "Y'all, y'all use one of y'all friends' bat. Leave the bat in the car." But I'm not paying no attention. You know, this is this 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 is this is um close friend of mine. I go, he's not a close friend of mine. This is my uncle. This is my mom's brother. You know, this is my mother's brother. So um. We end we end up um going we end up going out to eat. We end up going to a little restaurant on 79th and Ashland. The, um this restaurant and we uh, ordered us some, a couple of gyros and we just sitting down and we just talking. We just talking talking about the game, talking about life. Um then he asked me he said, "Man, ride with me to the hundreds. I got to go pick up one of my buddies." I said, "Man, that's cool. Now I'm already knowing like I'm with them. I'm good. You know, the the birthday party is over with. It's already like 4 5 o'clock now. It started at 2. I'm no longer going to make the birthday party, so I'm cool with that." So we picked up his buddy and then we we go back down down low. We went to 71st in Dorchester. Now, when we get to 71st in Dorchester, he um he tells me that he was about to go and um, talk to his guys that was on the corner. Like, I see all the guys on the corner. So they they was part of a rival game. So I told him, I'm not going to get out. I'm going to let y'all go talk to y'all guys. I'm going to sit in the car. And he went, talked to the guys, and then he jumped back in the car. He pulled the car. He got in the car and pulled off and pulled in the alley. He was like, man, I'm about to hide this work. 
And that's what we call crack cocaine. Like, man, I'm about to hide this work um, that I just got from you in this abandoned building. This is what we be hiding the work at. So I, I'm still not thinking nothing of it. You know, this is my uncle. So I'm I'm good. I'm not thinking nothing of it. So I got out the um, car and while he was parked, while he parked on the slab, I got out the car behind the um, abandoned building. And then I walked in the gangway because I had to take a leap. So I'm as I'm taking a leap, he hit me in the back with the bat. So when I turn around, I'm like, man, what's going on? So he like, man, you know what's going on. And he swung the bat at me again. And when he swung the bat at me again, I kind of pushed him to the side and I ran out of the gangway. And man, when I ran out of the gangway into the alley, man, all the guys that he was just talking to, like 15, 20 guys, they standing right there. This is what he already done told them they about to do to me. So, man, I ran right into their arms and they just instantly get to beat me and stumping me and beat me and kicking me and I'm on the ground, they stumping me, stumping me, all of them taking turns, just beat me, beat me, beat me. So I'm just asking him, like, man, why you doing this to me? And he was just telling me, like, man, them, man, they ain't having really, this don't have nothing to do with you, man. It's about them guys. Tell them guys that you messing with, man, we want $250,000 or we going to kill you and all this and all that. They just beat me, beat me, beat me. And, man, I, I watched a, a drop of blood turn into a puddle. So, man, um, long story short, man, they... They end up picking me up. The, the the big guy that we had picked up, he was like 6'9". He ended up picking me up, putting me in the trunk of a car, putting me in the trunk of the car that we was in. He put me in the trunk of the car. And um, when they slammed the trunk, uh, I, I knew they was, I, I already knew I was going to die. Like, man, they're going to they gonna kill me or whatever. So I'm just, um, man, I'm back there, man. I'm crying. I'm thinking about my son. My, my, my son was like 19 months old at the time. I'm just thinking about my son, like, man, I, I can't believe I'm going out like this. But all the time, my uncle talking through, he talking to me through the car. You know, he got the radio down. He, he steady conversating with me, just telling me, like, man, nephew, we ain't want to do this to you. We ain't want to do this to you and all this and all that. So I'm steady talking to him. So um, then, man, then I, I prayed. Like, I didn't know nothing about God at the time. I didn't know nothing about, didn't know nothing about Jesus. Didn't know nothing about none of that. And something just told me to pray. Some told me to pray. And then I just began to pray and just ask God to forgive me because I knew I was going to die. I thought well, I thought I was going to die. And I, I I just asked God to forgive me. And um, I remember it was like this peace came over me, like a, a peace. I stopped crying. I took my clothes that I had just bought. I wiped my face with with, with my clothes, my, the, the, the shirt that I, had, that I had just purchased. It was full of blood. I stopped crying. And... um. I was really now, I was just really waiting because I didn't know what they was going to do. But I wasn't scared anymore. I wasn't none of that. It was just like this peace, this, this, this entire peace just came over my body. And basically it was God just letting me know that I got you. Like, you're going to be all right. Um, and then like five minutes later, I felt the car stop moving. And then the trunk popped. And when the trunk popped, I kind of scooted all the way to the back of the car, to the back of the trunk because I thought they was going to shoot the, the back of the car up. And then I, the, I, the, the, the trunk popped open. And then when the trunk popped open, I saw the, the, the big guy that was right there that, that had put me in the trunk. He was standing right there and he was telling me, like, man, we're going to let you go. And then um, they ended up letting me go, laid me on the side of a garbage can because they had beat me so bad I couldn't move. I couldn't move at all. And um, they had laid me on the side of a garbage can. And some guys coming through the alley had found me and called the police for me, called the ambulance for me. You know what? The betrayal hurt more than the physical pain. Just trying to get over that, that 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 betrayal of me being betrayed by somebody who I looked up to all my life. And um, yeah, I was in a lot of physical pain, but my heart was hurt. I didn't understand like why you do this to me. Like why why did you do this to me? Me out of all people, you know. And um, I understand like we had been uh, you know having some differences. You know, over the last couple months before this had happened, but never in a million years would I have thought you'd have did this to me. You know, and um, man, I was just, I was, I was, I was just at a, I was at a low place in my life. But one thing that I do know, and I, and, and once I, once I gained my salvation, and I, I figured this out, 
Um, that day was really, um, I had to go through that to even end up where I am right now, because that was really my, that was really my make or break moment with God to act because when, um, the, some of my guys came and, um, seen me at the hospital and they was asking me for his address so they can go kill him. And I told them, no, you know, I told them, no, I said, no. And that was really the grace that I showed him. That was the grace that God had showed me. And I didn't know that at the time, you know, and that's why I believe right now to the day that I'm still alive because I showed him that grace. And I thought about my grandmother and his children when um that type of when when thinking about them burying him and have to go to his funeral or something like that. I thought about that, even though he didn't think about my mom and my siblings and my children when he was doing that to me. And I believe that's where um, me open was open to forgive him right then and there is where um, God God spared my life. And you know what? Like really to to be to be honest with you, um, my salvation didn't come until 2014. Even even after all that, um, I was in the hospital for six weeks, and then another um, like two three weeks recovering at one of my friends' house, um, just recovering. Um, I I I. I I was I was I was just I was just in a real real bad place. I was just in a real real bad place for for a few years. I I dealt with PTSD for like a year and a half. That was one of the worst things that I've ever dealt with. Um besides besides my depression, but um in 2010 I ended up moving um back to Milwaukee, Wisconsin over after a lot of things had started happening again in my life um with the gangs and just a, it was just a lot of stuff going on. So I decided, I said, you know what? I'm going to move to Milwaukee. I got to get away from Chicago because if I don't, somebody's going to eventually kill me or I'm going to kill somebody and I'm going to go to jail for the rest of my life. And now I had like four or five children and um, I had I had too many miles that was dependent on me. And I knew I had to do something better and I knew I wanted something better. So when I moved to Milwaukee, um, I ended up meeting my wife. And she introduced me to this church. Um, I this was 2014. I had just got out. Of, I had just got out of Lake County. I had just got out of Lake County Jail. Um, I was in. I had a, called a DUI coming from Chicago. I had um, wrapped, um, totaled my my conversion van on the way back from Chicago, coming from my grandmother's party. And um, man, I had. Um, Called a DUI, I was sloppy drunk, fell asleep behind the wheel. God spared me again. I didn't hit no car, I hit the wall, and um, totally destroyed, totally destroyed my um my my van. So um, that 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 happened in March, and then that happened in March of 2014. So Mother's Day, Mother's Day of 2014 was May 15th. I was in Chicago picking up my children, and in Chicago you can't be on your phone and driving at the same time. So I was on my phone talking and um, the police seen me. They pulled me over and stopped me. Come to find out I never went to court in um, Lake County when I had the DUI. So they ended up locking me up. So I ended up going to Cook County Jail for two weeks until, they, um, until the warrant was cleared. And then when the warrant got cleared, I, I, I got out. I was flat broke. I didn't have nothing. Um, everything that I... Everything that I had had the little two weeks that I was gone, it was gone. I had left it with somebody. They had spent all the money that I had gave them, all the little drugs and stuff that I had gave them. It was it was gone. So 
long story short, um, I end up my, my,